So welcome. Uh, I'm Victor Curran. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Transcendentalism Council of First Parish in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, our group uh, plans and presents events that educate and celebrate uh, the people and events that made Concord a center of American independence and imagination. Now, uh, it's difficult to imagine books more different than Hawthorne's moody romantic novels and Thoreau's philosophical nonfiction, but the two authors were really in the same boat, and I mean that literally. Mm -hmm. uh, tonight, we are happy to welcome Shelley Hawks and Richard Higgins as they explore those two authors' connections with each other and with the conquered landscape. You're welcome to ask questions uh, to be answered at the end of the lecture. We will have a Q&A. Uh, use the chat thread uh, to uh, open the chat window and type your question. Uh, so let me introduce our, our panelists. Shelley Drake Hawks uh, teaches art history and ethics at Middlesex Community College. Uh, she has master's in Asia studies from Harvard and a doctorate from Brown. Uh, she's the author of The Art of Resistance, Painting by Candlelight During Mao's Cultural Revolution, uh, and she's a docent at the Old Man's. Uh, Richard Higgins uh, is a writer, editor, and photographer. He's the author of the book, Faro and the Language of Trees. Uh, he's a graduate of Holy Cross, Columbia Journalism School, and Harvard Divinity School. And he recently wrote about Thoreau's Garrett in the American Scholar. He is on the board of directors of the Thoreau Society. So please join me in welcoming Shelley Hawks and Richard Higgins. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you. Well, I'll be speaking about Hawthorne. First off, I have a slide presentation tonight and it will take about 20 to 25 minutes. And then Rich will uh, respond to that. Uh, through the lens of Henry David Thoreau. So let me share my screen now. It'll just take me a minute to get set up here. Okay. So the title of my talk is when the wood paths shall be the aisles of our cathedral. Now, like most Americans, I first read the Scarlet Letter in high school and I liked it. Didn't completely understand it, but it stayed with me. I sympathized and admired Hawthorne's strong female protagonist, Hester Prynne. She kept her dignity even as she stepped out from the prison door and wore the Scarlet A on her dress. She withstood the villagers' scorn and eventually won them over by doing good works. Now that novel still stands up very well, but tonight I want to encourage you to read some of Hawthorne's less known writings to discover how his fiction moves us to care more about the natural world, in particular forests and trees and also butterflies. So Hawthorne is often remembered for the supernatural gloomy side to his fiction. His early stories retain a strong sense of the Puritan attitude towards forests. Puritans associated forests with danger, temptation, witchcraft, and other threats to a person's moral character. To early settlers, the clearing away of forests seemed a beneficial trend to make way for social order for villages, farming, and industry. Hawthorne's early stories drew on these negative associations with forests to create drama. For example, in his 1835 story, Young Goodman Brown, a vulnerable young man ventures into a forest at night. Whether his forest journey is real or a dream, we're not sure, but the result leads to the young man's unraveling. Anticipating Carl Jung's theory of archetypes, those universal patterns in human thinking, a forest path in Hawthorne's fiction represents an inner journey 
a crossroads in the life of an individual. Now, one of the major themes in Hawthorne's fiction is that absolutely everyone is prone to sin, even those who are supposed to be a model for others, like these Puritan ministers. To explain the dark mood of his fiction, we can point to Hawthorne's family ties to early Puritan settlers who, who persecuted Quakers and who condemned men and women to die in the Salem witch trials. Incidentally, these Puritan ministers pictured here are not Hawthorne's ancestors, but their stern faces do convey their austere demeanor, especially the one on the right. Now these two prints hang on the wall of the old manse in Concord, where Hawthorne lived in the 1840s. Hawthorne said he did not like them staring down and judging him. Now in his preface to the Scarlet Letter, Hawthorne suggests that he felt obligated to do penance for the curse that his Puritan ancestors wrought. Though a critic of Puritan intolerance and hypocrisy, Hawthorne still felt admiration for their morality, even though he found it uh, narrow. In his fiction, there are fascinating character studies of Puritan ministers facing up to their own sin. For example, in his 1832 short story, The Minister's Black Veil. And of course, there is Arthur Dimsdale in The Scarlet Letter. Now, after coming to live in Concord in 1842, Hawthorne's mood brightened under the influence of the transcendentalists, especially his wife, Sophia Peabody Hawthorne, pictured here in the center, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, pictured at the left under a rainbow in a painting which hangs at the Concord Free Public Library, and Margaret Fuller, pictured lower right, the pioneering feminist with whom the Hawthorne's developed a close friendship. Transcendentalists believed that immersion in nature uplifted and educated the soul. After his exposure to transcendentalism, we see a slight shift in Hawthorne's writings. Forest walks become more associated with preservation and healing. Contact with nature, for the most part, restores and spiritualizes his characters. Now here we have the old manse which Hawthorne and his wife rented from Emerson's family from 1842 to 1845. Sophia, a painter, rejuvenated the old parsonage's interior with hand-painted furniture and wallpaper. Hawthorne appreciated all she did to make it cheery inside, but he felt its exterior should not be changed. As he described in his preface to Mosses from an Old Manse, Hawthorne admired the home's simplicity its austerity and its longevity. Referring to the old parsonage, Hawthorne wrote, how gently did its gray homely aspect rebuke the speculative extravagances of the day. So here we feel a jolt of his trademark skepticism about some of the reforms of his day, which he feared might go too far in abandoning what was good in America. Now among his writings while living at the old manse, Hawthorne wrote two short pieces, Earth's Holocaust and Fire Worship. Earth's Holocaust contains the phrase I used as the title for my lecture, when the wood paths shall be the aisles of our cathedral. Hawthorne starts this short work by announcing that the world has become so overburdened that a massive bonfire has been started. People arrive from all over the world to toss things into the fire including weapons, religious objects, and even books of great authors. Many precious things are being lost. And certainly through this scenario, Hawthorne is expressing skepticism about these utopian plans. But interestingly, the narrator of the story does not totally regret the prospect of a leaner existence after all the trappings of civilization are gone. He relishes the chance for humanity to return to a more natural state identified with forests, prophesizing that a better future lies in a simpler world with fewer possessions, when the wood paths shall be the aisles of our cathedral and the firmament or sky shall be its ceiling. Now in fire worship, Hawthorne explores more of the pleasant aspects of fire. He personifies fire, calling it his ancient friend who deserves more gratitude from humanity than it receives. Fire never refused to come to the aid of anyone. 
the narrator, which seems Hawthorne's own voice, laments that he will miss fire's bright face as iron stoves rapidly replace the fireplace. Even he has installed stoves at the old manse. He wonders what will be the effect of losing the hearth, this congenial place within the home for socializing. Although the tone of fire worship is mostly humorous, there is a sober message underlying it. A fire at the hearth reminds us of our ancient roots when we spent more time outdoors. And in a later novel, The Marble Fawn, Hawthorne's character Kenyon comments that the world is sadder now as industry and machines exercise more power over life, nature's capacity to reach into our psyche and renew our ties to the earth, where they're shrinking. So in The House of Seven Gables, Hawthorne's 1851 novel, situated in his hometown of Salem, Colonel Pynchon selfishly snatches another family's land to build the house, setting off ripples of ill will. The sin shadows the Pension mansion for many generations. However, the Pension elm tree, a great mother tree, offsets the severity of the mansion. Both the house and the tree are strong presences in the novel. By virtue of its long continuance and great circumference, the stately elm as nature's representative is said to make amends every morning. It's full of the morning sun a sweetly tempered breeze lingers within its verdant sphere and sets a thousand leafy tongues a whispering. Insects buzz under its drooping shadow and in the late summer, its leaves prophesize autumn with a golden tinge. Now the year before Hawthorne moved to Concord with Sophia, he had joined a utopian experiment in communal living at a place called Brook Farm that was in West Roxbury. And it's depicted in this 1845 painting by Josiah Walcott. Now Hawthorne had hoped to bring his bride to live at Brook Farm, but life in the community did not afford him the privacy and the leisure he needed to write. So he left after half a year and his not so favorable experience there became the basis for his 1852 novel, The Blythedale Romance. Now in the Blythedale romance, the narrator of the tale, Coverdale, likes to retreat to a tree nest, a leafy hiding place and a listening post where he restores himself and sometimes eavesdrops on conversations as people walk below. From this natural turret, Coverdale looks down from his upper region and listens to the murmuring woods. He needs this green space to rejuvenate and in the same novel, the exuberant heroine Zenobia drowns herself in a forest stream near a tree stump, a symbol for her wasted potential. Her love interest, Hollingsworth, discarded her carelessly. Hawthorne describes Zenobia as having a surplus of vitality and passion. She seems to embody nature itself. Her end could prophesize the end of nature, which Hawthorne feared. Now, Zenobia's suicide is a vivid scene in the novel, and it's open to multiple interpretations. In another four scene from the, from the Blythedale romance, Coverdale describes an inspiring oration by the charismatic philanthropist Hollingsworth, who uses a granite boulder for his pulpit. According to legend, it's the same boulder used a century before by Reverend John Eliot to preach Christianity to Native Americans. Hollingsworth speaks in a strain that rises and falls as naturally as the wind's breath among the leaves of the birch tree. Coverdale says no other speech of man had ever moved him so. The sermon is greatly enhanced by its outdoor location in what Hawthorne describes as a green cathedral. Now Hawthorne respected Native traditions and he felt sad for the way Native Americans had been treated. Here is a page from the common journal that Hawthorne kept with his wife, showing her outlines of chiseled arrowheads found on the old man's property. His friend, Henry David Thoreau, taught him how to look for these in the soil. And in his story, Young Goodman Brown, Hawthorne had addressed America's past. 
After Goodman enters the forest, a dark clad figure informs him of his Puritan ancestors' wicked actions. After the young man protests that his fathers were all honest men and good Christians, the man with serpent staff insists, it was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. Though Hawthorne showed sympathy for defeated peoples like Native Americans, Hawthorne had a blind spot when it came to defending the enslaved African Americans. He did not embrace the abolitionist cause, though many of his neighbors in Concord did. But Hawthorne was strong in his respect for wildlands. Besides forests, Hawthorne praised meadows as a tonic for the spirit. Whereas a forest encloses a person, a meadow gives release. Hawthorne praised meadows as among the most satisfying objects in natural scenery. The heart reposes on them with the feeling that few things else can give because almost all other objects are abrupt and clearly defined, but a meadow stretches out like a small infinity, yet with a secure homeliness, which we do not find either in an expanse of water or of air. And here's another beautiful meadow on the other side of the Old North Bridge. The previous photograph, this one and the next one are by a professional photographer named John Burris. The Concord River behind the old manse gave Hawthorne great pleasure. And I'll read this quote in a minute. Henry David Thoreau sold Hawthorne his boat and they went boating together and even did some ice skating here on the river. Now coming from Salem where he had taken frequent walks along the ocean, Hawthorne joked that the Concord River seemed very sluggish. Its current was so slow and with that in mind, let me read what Hawthorne said. Looking downward at a long extent of the river, it struck me that I had done it some injustice in my remarks. At a distance, it looked like a strip of sky set into the earth. This dull river has a religion of its own. Now, in one of my favorite Hawthorne short stories called The Artist of the Beautiful, this was written while he was in Concord in 1844. The male protagonist, Owen Warland, takes inspiration from the butterfly. Owen falls into depression when his love interest marries his rival, an overbearing blacksmith named Robert Danforth. But the sight of a, a butterfly, it's, it, the graceful flutter of its wings, rekindles Owen's love for life and reminds him of his creative side and his love for nature. Owen had apprenticed as a watchmaker but his wandering imagination led him to create fanciful rather than useful things. And when he finally achieves his dream of designing a mechanical butterfly, the delicate invention has only a moment of flight before it's crushed under a child's foot. However, Owen stays composed because he realizes that the true butterfly was something internal, his artistic spirit, which could not be snatched from him. Now in the Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne and Arthur Dimsdale shed their inhibitions and redeclare their love for each other in a forest setting. Under the shade and accompanied by their child Pearl, the couple embrace and dream of a new future. Hester takes off the, uh, the, the Scarlet A, uh, which marks her sin, but in the end, she puts it back on the letter has come to be part of her identity. And in the minds of the villagers who once scorned her but now admire her, the A is not limited to its original meaning of adulteress. Its meaning has been transformed to include angel or artist. Her act of putting the A back on in the forest, that emblem of her sin, is significant for Hawthorne. His characters are ennobled when they recognize their capacity for sin and rise above it. Hawthorne brings this out even more clearly in a later novel called The Marble Fawn, in which a few of the main characters are involved in a murder. Hawthorne's fiction teaches that no one is without sin, but the noble strive toward goodness, a goodness he comes to associate with nature 
after his exposure to the transcendentalists. Now Hawthorne's 1843 short story, The New Adam and Eve, imagines the first man and woman of a new civilization after nature has been destroyed and only buildings and pavement remain. In this new world, Eve can only find one tuft of grass. Hawthorne was ahead of his time in recognizing that a thriving natural world is not a given and that nature as a benign force could be lost to indifference as humanity becomes consumed with building cities and extracting resources. Hawthorne begins his 1843 parable about the new Adam and Eve like this. We who are born into the world's artificial system can never adequately know how little in our present state and circumstances is natural. It's only through the medium of the imagination that we can lessen those iron fetters. Let us suppose the day of doom has burst upon the globe. To repeople this waste and deserted earth, we will suppose a new Adam and a new Eve. Now in works like The New Adam and Eve, Hawthorne anticipates these environmentalists, E.O. Wilson, Bill McKibben, and Rachel Carson, who warn that humanity must do more to safeguard the natural world and reverse the harmful impact that our way of life has wrought on other species and precious ecosystems. According to biologist E.O. Wilson, human interest in non-human species provides the foundation for an enduring conservation ethic. Wilson writes about this in his wonderful memoir called The Naturalist. He reminds us that children have a spontaneous interest in tiny life forms like Owen's love for butterflies and the artist of the beautiful. In Wilson's case, he first fell in love with organisms at age seven when he encountered a jellyfish on Paradise Beach in Florida. Later, Wilson became an authority on ants. And now at age 91, he's one of the foremost advocates for biodiversity. In his book, Half Earth, Wilson calls for humanity to, st to strategically set aside large patches of land and ocean for wildlife, to foster the survival of as many ecosystems as possible. In the top left photo, we find Bill McKibben, who has sternly warned about humanity's disregard for nature in his classic book called The End of Nature. And similarly, in her book, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson documented the destruction caused by the pesticide DDT to humans and wildlife, opening her book with a parable about a silent spring without the sound of birds. So in The New Adam and Eve, Hawthorne imagined a sterile world with only buildings and pavement present. He warned that humanity has grown so accustomed to living in an artificial system that we might not even recognize when the natural world, our green cathedral, is being lost, partly due to our own actions or our inaction. Hawthorne's fiction beckons us to appreciate a forest's power to awaken our imagination and educate our souls. And in closing, I want to give special thanks to the Concord Land Conservation Trust, which preserves wildlands in Concord. Their trails through the forest have provided great comfort and recreation to the public during this time of COVID. Thank you very much. And now I'm pleased to uh, introduce Rich Higgins, who will uh, react to that. Thank you. Oh, you're muted, Rich. All right. That was great, Charlie. Thank you very much. I, I love the idea of a, a heart reposing in a meadow. Very, very beautiful. Well, um, Thoreau was... <laughs> was drawn to nature, I would say, not as a symbol of anything, but because of a deep personal and emotional connection he felt, even as a boy. Uh, he felt joy and wonder and awe in nature. Being out in it simply made him happy. Uh, there was an inexpressible happiness in nature, he wrote, 
It was where he could be, quote, glad with an entire gladness. He also said, I do not see that I can live tolerably without affection for nature. If I feel no softening toward the rocks, what do they signify? And it was this softening or affection, he also called it sympathy with intelligence uh, toward nature that let him observe its details and secrets, see its beauty, intuit its meanings and recognize its unity, all of which undergird his environmental ethics that continue to inspire us today. So just to point out that at the beginning here that Thoreau was not an armchair romantic about nature. That said, his views of it were in many, very similar in many ways to those of Hawthorne and of the romantic movement in general. So I'm gonna look at where Thoreau agreed with Hawthorne, where he differed and where he went completely beyond it. So first some similarities. We heard from Shelley that, uh, quote, religious faith and wildness intermingle in Hawthorne's stories. That shaded blends, for example, evoke an aura of mystery and sacredness. I'm going to pause here to share my screen and um, uh, whoop. Sorry, hold on. Um, okay. Well, I can't seem to get it to go into, hold on here. Um, okay, there we go, sorry. That was, that was not good. But anyway, thank you very much. Um, I, so I was saying that um, in the first similarity was that uh, we heard that religious faith and wildness intermingle in Hawthorne's stories and that shaded glens evoke aura and sacredness. And for Thoreau, um, and I think probably even more so than for Hawthorne, nature was the medium through which spirit manifested itself, through which divinity and truth were communicated. Despite his harsh criticism of ministers and meeting houses, he was in fact religious to the bone and there is a palpable sense of the holy in his writing about nature. He called the forest in particular, the threshold to heaven. It was where he encountered the divine and unfathomable mystery. His sensory experience of the forest was like a spiritual elixir to him. The mere aromatic pungent smell of the pine could restore his spirits. Or as he wrote in 1851, at the sound of the wind in the trees, my heart leaps into my mouth. I recover my spirits, my spirituality through my hearing. Now, these are not new thoughts, of course. Rousseau in the 18th century found a spiritual value in the beauty of nature. And his American contemporary, and I didn't realize Jonathan Edwards and Rousseau really almost overlapped in their um, years, uh, and Edwards being, of course, Hawthorne and Thoreau's Puritan forebear, thought the book of nature was as much a revelation of God as the Bible. Walking in the woods as a boy in Connecticut, he wrote, there came to my mind so sweet a sense of the glorious majesty and grace of God, I know not how to express. God's excellency, wisdom, pur purity, and love seem to appear in everything, in the sun, moon and stars, in the cloud and blue sky, in the grass, flowers, trees, in the water, in all nature. Now, another similarity uh, was that Thoreau, like Hawthorne, but again, I think even more so, used the imagery and terms of church architecture to describe the forest. Um, uh, he saw trees as spires and, and shrines, and in the fall, burning bushes. And here are some images. These are all my photographs, I should say. Uh, this is Fairhaven Hill, Fairhaven Cliff, um, Fairhaven Cliff. 
weld in there. These are actually these tall pines that are spires are actually spiring right over Thoreau's grave there on Sleepy Hollow. Um, um, and, and in, in 1841, for example, uh, Thoreau actually described in a journal entry something very similar to Hawthorne's vision in 1844 in Earth's Holocaust, as Shelley described, in which wood paths shall be the aisles of our cathedral. So Thoreau wrote in January of 1841, trees covered with snow admit a very plain and clear light. You glance up these paths closely embowered by bent trees as through the side aisles of the cathedral and expect to hear a choir chanting from their depths. You are never so far in them as they are far before you. Their secret is where you are not and where your feet can never carry you. And on November 30, 1858, he again found himself in a forest cathedral. These were the, these were the burning bushes. I'll, I'll get this coordinated here in a minute, but uh, yeah. And now we're in the forest cathedral. So <clears throat> November 30, 1858, uh, going westward through Wheeler's Al Wood, the sun rather low is seen through the wood with a cold dazzling white luster like that of burnished tin reflected from the silvery needles of the pine. You stand in the quiet and somewhat somber aisles of a forest cathedral where cold green masses alternate with pale brown, but also warm leather colored ones, almost red. Dark trunks streaked with snow rise on all sides and a pure white floor stretches around. However, a difference <clears throat> is that where in Hawthorne, so Hawthorne made wild places symbolic of churches and worship spaces. Thoreau saw them as the actual sanctuaries themselves. The woods were his sanctum sanctorum, his holy of holies, where he quote, got what others get from church going. It angered him that the building of a church often led to the quote, desecration and destruction uh, of far, far grander temples not made with human hands. Now, Thoreau also thought with Hawthorne that humanity was at its most vital when blended with nature, uh, rather than standing apart from it, as, as Shelley told us. To Thoreau, uh, humans were part and parcel of nature. The laws of nature, he wrote, are the laws of my own nature, and, and therefore a life in accord with it was a true path to enjoyment and fulfillment. Now, I'm going to look at three ways that Thoreau emphatically disagreed with Hawthorne. Now, Hawthorne, at least in his earlier work, uh, as Shelley told us, embraced the Puritan view of forest as a dark world, a realm of heathens, devils, and temptation, in contrast to the order and righteousness of Puritan plantations. Uh, quote, Beware the evening wolves, Cotton Mather warned in the early 1700s, quote, the rabid and howling wolves of the wilderness, which would wreak havoc among you and not leave your bones till morning. Uh, and again, as Shelley described, Hawthorne kept, captures that fear exquisitely in Young Goodman Brown. And I will have to give, give credit to uh, Hawthorne that he later revises that image or that symbol of the forest. And uh, as Shelley told us, uh, reminds us in Scarlet Letter, Hester and Dimsdale shed their inhibitions in the forest. So that's a good, Thoreau would have approved of that, that movement. Uh, he, he utterly rejected the idea of the forest as a dark world. Uh, in fact, he had boundless contempt for it. And I'm reading a biography of Luther now, and it's astonishing how much Thoreau and Luther were alike in their moral uh, indignation. Uh, for Thoreau, forests infused human society with, with vigor, health, and enlightenment. Quote, what would we do without forests, those natural cities? He asked in, in walking, his essay walking. And in his journal, he wrote, 
what should we do with a man who is afraid of the woods, afraid of their solitude and darkness? What salvation is there for him? Thoreau even loved the uh, dark, shadowy parts of the forest. Um, in the dark and gloomy woods, there is a quote, there is a certain fertile sadness I would not avoid, he said, but rather earnestly seek. It saves my life from being trivial. And in, uh, this is Tobin Woods in Concord. Um, it's also Tobin Woods. Um, this is actually near a, 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 behind a tennis court near my house, which is only to say that these kinds of trees are everywhere if we, if we pause and take a look uh, and are fortunate enough to see them. Uh, so Thoreau, I mean, yeah, Thoreau said um, also very famously in the essay Walking, when I seek to recreate, recreate myself, I seek the darkest wood, the thickest and most interminable, uh, and to the citizen, most dismal swamp. The second big difference uh, is on original sin. Uh, Shelley uh, said that in Hawthorne, the, a, a path through a forest represents a journey into a, the deeper, a deeper self. And Thoreau does certainly agree with that much. But in Hawthorne, the inner journey is through a dark valley of remorse. Only those who acknowledge their capacity for sin are ennobled by the forest. The shadow of sin is everywhere present in Hawthorne. Thoreau completely rejected the depravity of man or the idea that human nature is stained by sin. And he therefore, therefore felt that therefore we should not spend our lives repenting for it. And again, this is in accord with Rousseau, who, uh, who said there is no original perversity in the human heart. Dispense with repentance, Thoreau wrote in 1850. God prefers that you approach him thoughtful, not penitent, though you are the chief of sinners. It is only by forgetting yourself that you draw near to him. And in 1859, he wrote, it is not by a timid and feeble repentance that a man will save his soul and live. And he also made fun of the uh, church people who would, as he said, cry repent at the newborn babe. Um, so uh, as a schoolboy, uh, both Hawthorne and Thoreau had to read the New England Primer, uh, of which there's an image here. Uh, and they both had to learn the rhyme, in Adam's fall, we send all. Now, whereas Hawthorne I, I think one could say internalize that certainly to some extent, Thoreau would turn that lesson on its head, writing, quote, in the new Adam's rise, we shall all reach the skies. Nature was the very embodiment of that raw, vigorous purity and lack of guilt. Nothing, he said, stands up more free from blame. Nothing stands up more free from blame than a pine tree. And here are some pines standing up free from blame. That is the thorough pine in Monroe State Park. It was the first Eastern white pine in Massachusetts to be measured at um, 160 feet. And um, the Eastern Native Tree Society and, uh, has they've now found uh, something like 130 trees at uh, white pines that uh, are that tall, but that was the first and uh, uh, Bob Leverett named it after uh, thorough. I have another pine there. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause my screen sharing now and uh, just for a little bit. Um, all right. So um, the third difference is that Hawthorne chiefly sees nature through uh, a human lens. Forests play a recuperative function in his work, as uh, Shelley tells us, but chiefly to recuperate men and men and women. Thoreau saw a, quote, much grander significance in natural phenomenon, quote, would not refer to man and his needs, but viewed absolutely. And in Faith in a Seed, he writes that, quote, the world is rich with value, not of our making. So although Thoreau indeed uh, thought that nature was good for man, 
be felt even more strongly that it was simply good in itself. All right, now there are some, uh, just a few ways that I'm gonna talk about that in which Thoreau went completely beyond uh, not only Hawthorne, but prevailing views of the romantic views of nature. These are his contributions, I would say, to the romantic view of nature. The main thing that Thoreau added was particularity. His views of nature were grounded in his granular, tangible, sensory experience of it. Quote, for joy, I could embrace the earth. I shall delight to be buried in it. He expressed this particularity in his keen attention to natural fact and, the, and his detailed descriptions of them. One winter, he was delighted to see a flock of brilliant crimson birds busily feeding on the seeds of a birch tree, shaking down the powdery, powdery snow as they did. They were, quote, birds of paradise in the midst of a New England winter, quote, close quote. And he described himself, himself as enchanted and even overcome by their beauty and significance. My body is all sentient, he wrote. As I go here or there, I am tickled by this or that I come into contact with as if I touched the wires of a battery. The age of miracles is each moment thus returned. Now it is wild apples, now river reflections, now a flock of lesser red poles. Another idea that Thoreau added, or maybe just an emphasis that he placed was that of the restorative and rejuvenating power of nature. A thorough experience this re rejuvenation many times in his life, uh, certainly after John's death, as is very well known, and, and during his periodic battles with melancholy, as he called it, or depression. As he wrote in Walden, there can be no, there can be no very black melancholy in, to him who lives in the midst of nature and has his senses still. For Thoreau, nature was the fountain and source of his physical health and vitality, his sanity and spiritual well-being. He compared himself to Antaeus of Greek myth, who fought with Hercules, uh, who remained invincible as long as his feet were touching the earth, because he was also the son of the earth goddess Gaia. So the earth was his mother. But Thoreau carried this idea even further making the woods a tonic to heal, not just the individual, but all humanity. Quote, our village life would stagnate, he wrote in Walden, quote, if it were not for the unexplored forests and meadows which surround it, we need the, the tonic of wildness. And in walking, he wrote, quote, a town is saved not more by the righteous men in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it. From them and from the wilderness come the, quote, tonics and barks that brace mankind. A thorough also um, expanded, I would say, our understanding of the uh, aesthetic power of nature. <clears throat> it was not only a source of inspiration to human creativity, but in Thoreau's view, it was art itself. Uh, in nature, he said, were all the templates and ideas of art already perfectly composed, written, painted, and sculpted on the landscape. Trees were among the living poems that nature wrote. And I'm gonna very gracefully go back to my um, uh, PowerPoint. Boy, was that smooth, huh? And uh, go on to the next image. Uh, go on to the next image. The zoom bar is blocking uh, slide slide share view. So we have to pause. Shelly, could you sing a few bars of the Concord hymn while the... <laughs> Actually, well, it, looks, it looks pretty good, Rich. I'm going I know, but, it, but it's not... Um, there we go. All right. So here we go. So we have uh, trees as living poems. That's what he called them. And here are some uh, that I have noticed. It, it was, I was struck. I just picked out some images, six of trees that were living poems. And I realized afterwards, the first four are all pairs of trees. These are two apple trees in um, Thornton, New Hampshire, where Jenny and I sometimes go. Um, these are uh, beaches by Northbridge, just above Northbridge. Um, 
Esterbrook Woods. I love these guys. I call them the twins. They're just two trees in the uh, in the Acton Cemetery on Concord Road, but I just they seem epulent or something like that. Um, this is an old sugar oak, a very old sugar oak on a 117 down by Nine Acre Corner in Concord. This is uh, again up in New Hampshire. Um, and in addition to so the templates of art, so those are trees as living poems, but they, it can, trees contained and nature contained art in other forms. And uh, here is an image of um, a, tr a reflected tree going down, uh, going over a very small waterfall on Barrett Mill Road near where I live. Um, and the same day I took this, um, again, that's a reflection of, of a tree uh, in that, in that brook. Um, and the leaf, you know, this was the, the, the ur form, the, the, the original template of art in, in nature, thorough thought. It was repeated everywhere in the human hand and the moose antlers and the feathers of a bird, uh, just endlessly repeated this, the, 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 the uh, template of the leaf. Um, and one winter I was, <laughs> of course, I guess we have a, a New England house, we keep it on the cool side. And um, we had this frost one day on the window, this was our bedroom, and you see in the frost, you know, the, the leaf. Uh, emerging out, the idea of the leaf making itself known even in the frost. Um, and then a couple Januarys ago, when it was super cold, Walden froze really, really hard. And um, I went over it one afternoon, delighted, and um, took many pictures of the branching in the cracks. So this is really <laughs> what it looks like. It's a it's a fissure in the ice, but that is branching out like a tree. And you know the problem with technology and Photoshop and all this is no one will believe me that that maple leaf was there encased in, in the ice. But I, I give you my assurance it, it, it was. It was just frozen there. So we have the the um, the leaf uh, as uh, the, the tree branching and the leaf uh, forms. Uh, that nature endlessly repeats. Um, and these are just some stumps. These are actually at the Concord landfill, but um, I go there sometimes and take, take pictures of the stumps. Um, and I mean, you know, what can you say? This is incredible. You know, it's wonderful. Um, now, Thoreau also believed, uh, this is a, a fourth way that I would say that he, that he contributed to the romantic idea of, um, of nature. Uh, he believed that nature enhances our perception of the moral law uh, because uh, natural beauty and natural justice were linked for Thoreau. Now a beautiful landscape and an ethical human life are both about balance, harmony, and things being in right relationship not a distorted one, which is how Thoreau saw uh, his, human society in his day. And you know, shamefully, it is even more distorted today. So as Terry Tempest Williams said, writing about Thoreau, in a world in which moral ugliness prevailed, creating beauty was its own form of resistance. I find that very consoling as someone who uh, could be more politically active than I am. Uh, I sometimes, you know, regret that, but you know, creating beauty is something I love to do, and the idea that that's a resistance against a uh, morally ugly world is uh, it's a very comforting thought. Uh, uh, so the idea of um, nature express, expressing things in right relationship and, and balance, I tried to pick some images I've taken of um, of that kind of harmony we see in nature. Um, And Thoreau said, uh, made this point explicitly in Autumnal Tense when he wrote, um, 
the perception of beauty is a moral test because we quote, receive as much beauty in nature as we already possess. And in his journal, June 5, 1852, the constant query nature puts is, are you virtuous? Then you can behold me, beauty, frag fragrance, music, sweetness and joy of all kinds are for the virtuous. And Thoreau's opposition to uh, slavery, uh, again, this is Tobin Woods, um, another image of just everything connected just right, just in right relationship to each other. Um, October Farm, a conservation land. Shelley mentioned the Concord Conservation Land Trust. This is one of their, uh, uh, it's not their property, but they have a right of way and a beautiful trail all through it. Um, it's a, a glorious autumn day. Why this um, just so captivates me, the balance of all of those elements, you know, just to me, incredibly beautiful. Um, Again, up in New Hampshire, where we go at a pond, sunset, or actually sunrise, it was. Um, well, Thoreau's opposition to slavery and his defense of nature were both rooted in the ethical vision of his essay that we know as civil disobedience. As he was writing that essay uh, around 1847, 48, he gave a lecture in Concord in 1848 explaining why he had gone to jail for the night in 1846. At that very same time, he was finishing the manuscript of A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, in which he, he talks about the way that the uh, Belrica Dam has distorted and slowed the Concord River and changed the whole you know, natural ecosystem of the river. And he writes in that uh, book, who hears the fishes when they cry? So it's the same ethical vision uh, from, that, uh, from that essay. Well, I think my main point overall about Thoreau is that in every way possible, Thoreau saw the power of nature not as something additive or remedial or ennobling from, that changes us from the outside, but rather as an internal dynamic force, as the ungovernable spirit of life itself at the very core of our existence, something essential to our health and well-being. And just close with a reflection, we were asked to uh, reflect on Thoreau's ecological vision. Uh, and fair to say that, of course, it anticipated contemporary ecocentrism. Uh, Shelley mentioned uh, E.O. Wilson as a um, spiritual heir of, uh, heir of uh, Hawthorne's. And I, Wilson called Thoreau the, quote, founding saint of the conservation movement and environmental activists and nature writers have been turning to him as a beacon and spokesman for more than a century. Thoreau inspired John Muir, who went on to crusade for the national park system. And Thoreau's calls to live more simply, care for the earth and preserve wildness are today carried on by the ever burgeoning simplicity, su sustainability and environmental movements. So overall, I think we can say that Thoreau is more alive today than when he was buried here in Concord 150 years ago. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for, for your beautiful pictures and your commentary. Thank you as well, Shelley. Uh, we have uh, a number of questions here from uh, our uh, attendees. And uh, so uh, some of them are addressed to uh, one or another of you. Others are uh, kind of open and I'll, I'll uh, leave it up to you to, to uh, uh, volunteer who wants to speak to them. Um, first one, did Thoreau consider himself a pantheist? And if so, did he create that concept? I, I guess I have to take that one. Well, no, he certainly did not. Uh, pan created, <laughs> uh, created pantheism. Well, it's complicated. I, it really it would take a whole lecture. I think that he was, uh, uh, on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, he was a pantheist. And on the other days of the week, he was a little more traditional. Um, pantheism is the belief that um, 
all things in nature are equal to the divine. There's no, there's no change there. They're, they're, they are one and, and the same. And there's also something called panentheism in which um, there is a distinction between the divine and nature. God is in nature, but also uh, above and beyond nature in some way. And uh, in my reading, I think Thoreau is more of a panentheist. Uh, if you take into consideration uh, things they wrote after after a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, which was his first book, and in which he's you know a great uh, tirade against the artificialities of formal religion and Christianity in particular. He's often quite funny in in uh, debunking it. But um, uh, through the rest of his life, and if you read his journal, the uh, number of times that he um, uh, you know was, addresses himself to or uh, acknowledges the presence of something transcendent, divine, other, mysterious, that deeply affected him. I, I think you have to say that at a minimum, uh, at, a, at a minimum, we don't know. But um, I don't think a pantheist is a fully accurate term for Thoreau. Thank you, Richard. Um, I hope I'm reading this question correctly. According to Emerson, humans are part and parcel of God. Are they, meaning Emerson and Thoreau, expressing the same idea? Shelley, you want to take that? Uh, sorry. Uh, I think Hawthorne uh, was not a churchgoer, but he would consider himself within the Christian community. And um, I don't, he, I, I think perhaps Thoreau was a bit bolder in terms of challenging theology than Hawthorne was, but, but uh, Hawthorne was a fiction writer and, you know, he, uh, through the way he integrated nature into his stories, I, I just feel that he really did value uh, the mystery and the rejuvenating qualities of nature. And I think he did associate that with uh, divine power but I'm not sure if he, he got more specific than that. Did you want to take that uh, question? Well, I would just say that, you know, whether or not he used any theological language, at least from Thoreau's point of view, made zero difference. He was, you know, not interested in defining these kind of terms at all. What mattered was experience, religious experience. And what mattered was the, uh, those kinds of feelings that Hawthorne had. So how you defined it uh, was not, not of paramount importance to Thoreau. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, Shelley. Uh, next question. I have a question about how Hawthorne and Thoreau see unity and disunity with nature as it relates to human relations, both with the natural world and with one another. In other words, are the forests and woods and bodies of water sites not just of illumination, but reconciliation, places where we are restored, brought together and made whole, or even places where compensation for loss is offered. Mm. <laughs> That's, uh, we, I, we have some really thought provoking questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, answer, answer to that one is yes. It's, it's a great, <laughs> A great audience. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I would say that, um, uh, you know, for Thoreau, um, you know, nature, um, uh, this the spirit of wildness that he wrote about that is embodied in nature is also in, in us. And that when we are, when we separate ourselves from nature, we lose some of that vitality. We lose some of who we truly are. And so we then do become separate from nature. But that is not our native state. That is not how... You know, and so we can achieve that reconciliation by reconnecting, re-emerging uh, with nature. And so anyway, he's very critical of, of the society of his day, you know, of uh, slavery and, you know, there's a lot, lot wrong. So it, it didn't mean that he regarded, you know, people as, you know, beyond hope or something. Uh, they were just, um, you know, not living in accord with nature and with natural law. And I would say that uh, Hawthorne envisioned the forest as a place of reckoning and that, uh, you know, a, a, 
uh, it was a place where nature could reach into your psyche and really make you think about the truth or um, sort of own up to your sin, perhaps. Uh, so it, it was, uh, um, you know, in some ways, a kind of a device in his stories, but, but also he felt it himself. He also, if you read his notebooks and things, he, he really relished the scenery and going for walks, etc. Well, speaking of, of um, Thoreau as a critic of society, uh, here, is a, here is a question in that vein, for, and it's addressed to both of you. Um, if Hawthorne and Thoreau were to come to Concord for one day in 2021, do you think they would be discouraged by they, what they saw or encouraged? Well, I would say that um, Thoreau was, <clears throat> was horrified by what he called the trivial gossip going on in America. Uh, and, uh, and he had his only inkling of social media or the smartphone was to telegraph the transatlantic cable and maybe I don't, I don't know what else to train. I mean, so yeah, I think he would be, uh, I think it'd be a very tough reentry for Thoreau today. Uh, I, I think Hawthorne would also be uh, discouraged and somewhat pessimistic, uh, but I think he would he would recognize Concord itself in that there still are some of these landmarks and there still is a feeling a strong feeling of community in Concord itself. Uh, these kind of public conversations, I think I think he would approve of that. And you know, and what we're doing here. What we're doing, you know, tonight is, you know, similar to the Concord Lyceum, and we're trying to share ideas and community and whatnot. So I mean, think Thoreau would would approve of technology to that extent, but um, when we become tools of our tools, then that's something else. Okay, um, here's another question: uh, When Hawthorne and Thoreau were together on foot or in the boat. Can you see the differences in their approaches from what they each recorded of their excursions or experiences? Are there instances where they both recount being in the same landscape at the same time and responding to it, or even in the same place at different times, not together? I would say Hawthorne thought of Thoreau as his teacher. I think that Hawthorne, uh, Hawthorne wrote about Thoreau a lot. It seems Thoreau did not write about Hawthorne much. Uh, so, but uh, I think that um, Hawthorne was just really impressed by Thoreau's detailed knowledge and just uh, seemed to take him on adventures that he couldn't have imagined. So I, I don't have a really good answer for that question. But oh, very good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking that, um, <clears throat> Yeah, as I, as I said in my talk that, you know, Hawthorne wrote in the short story about a day when, you know, our, our, our future in a forested world where, you know, aisles, you know, wood paths will become the aisles of our cathedral. And Thoreau actually described that. I mean, he actually wrote about that. So, um, you know, he obviously was uh, more intimately, you know, connected with the natural world. Although I will say that when Ross, Moss is from the old man's, Shelley does have some good reflections on conquered nature. Does, does it not? Yes. Yeah. 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 I think that that anthology is really a wonderful anthology. It has so much richness in it. I highly recommend it. And, and uh, Richard Smith contributes this in the chat. He says that Thoreau does not mention Hawthorne at all in his journal. I believe that's it. from somebody who has really read it. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question, what uh, uh, did either of the authors take part in Quaker meeting circles in the woods as part of their spiritual lives? Hmm. Hawthorne wrote about the Quakers uh, that there was one called, a short story called The Gentle Boy. But I don't know uh, too much about his interest in the Quaker meeting circles, but that's an interesting question. It's kind of hard to imagine him doing that. <laughs> Rich, what about you? Well, I mean, um, Thoreau, um, you know, Ricketts, Ricketts, Daniel Ricketson, his, his very close friend was a Quaker. Um, you know, I think Thoreau had to be uh, empathetic to their, you know, the 
the stillness and, and um, meditative silence with which they prayed. But um, I, I, I'm not aware of his mentioning them specifically, nor of Quakers being especially in the woods. I mean, they had the Quaker meeting houses. Um, but if they did meet in the woods, Thoreau would have liked that. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Well, we have had uh, some great questions and uh, certainly a uh, terrific presentation from both of you. Uh, uh, wait a minute, we have another question popping up here. Um, Concord was neither heavily wooded uh, nor particularly wild in Thoreau and Hawthorne's day, although both expressed wonder and respect for natural places and processes. How much did human stewardship and use of this land factor into their estimation of nature? I think uh, Hawthorne really loved the old man's property because he it, he was actually doing some farming. He was chopping his own wood. He kept a garden there and he went on daily walks and he really uh, was immersed in a natural setting. But I don't know if he would really understand some of the concepts uh, like stewardship uh, in the same way we would. Victor, I was looking at a chat question. Could you just repeat that question briefly for me? The question is, uh, Concord was neither heavily wooded nor particularly wild in Thoreau and Hawthorne's day, but both expressed wonder and respect for natural places and processes. How much did human stewardship, uh, uh, excuse me, how much did human stewardship and use of this land factor into their estimation of nature. So, I, so I, I, I think I think the idea is how much was their uh, was their understanding of nature yeah. filtered through the fact that the, the 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 natural space they were living in wasn't pristine. Oh, absolutely, humans had been living there for two hundred years yeah. and, and, oh, and changing it. Yeah. Absolutely, and that was not all negative for Thoreau, as much as he uh, loved wildness and, and was an advocate for it. When he came back from uh, climbing Mount Katahdin, he was he was relieved to come back to the somewhat domesticated, to the to the varied mix of human and wild in in Concord. He found that appealing, and you know Thoreau also said at some point, you know, that um, he was born in just the nick of time. It was actually a kind of a pun because uh, the, the uh, millennials were forecasting the end of the world in 1844. But um, you know, you know, he was born in the most estimable town in all the world. Well, that's an interesting. What what he meant was, it was my town. It, it was that Concord was better, but this is the landscape that he knew and he loved. It was a part of him. And so that's what made it the most estimable place in all the world. Not any particular qualities that it had compared to some other place. So, thank you. Okay, here's a, here's uh, uh, and, and and I think this will be the last pair of questions, uh, and we have one for each of you. Uh, for Richard, is there a particular section of the book Walden that you return to? most often or that you feel you know by heart? Well, I think the, um, in the solitude chapter, Thoreau describes as being, you know, sort of initially questioning if he can, if he can last, if he can make it there. I don't know if I have my, my book handy. I don't know if I can quote it by heart, but he, you know, um, after a moment's doubt, he, he senses that he's, surrounded by all these all this sentient life that's reaching out to him and the pine needles and everything is welcoming and him and cheering him and he and he, he just he just gets over it and he you know he's um realizes that he's going to go on and, and, and keep faith with with his experiment so that i can't quote from it but that section in solitude i think is very beautiful thank you richard okay here's the question for shelley um <clears throat> Is there any record of Hawthorne responding to or reaching out to Thoreau after he spent a night in jail? I don't know of any. 
I'm sorry, but but Hawthorne, uh, Hawthorne didn't live in Concord uh, that uh, in 1846, so maybe that, that uh, Thoreau wasn't so much on his radar. But <laughs> they, they continue to be friends, and I remember that Hawthorne invited Thoreau to come speak in Salem, and then they became friends again when Hawthorne and his family moved back to Concord uh, in the 1850s. Um, but uh, I wish they had gotten to have more time together. I think they, they would have been a really interesting long-term friendship if they had spent more time together. Okay, uh, well, thank you both. Uh, and thanks to all, all of, of you uh, in our, in our uh, audience for joining us tonight. Uh, I do hope uh, that you will join us for the Transcendentalism Council's next event on May 10th, Monday, May 10th. Uh, which is called, Is My Verse Alive? Letters of Thomas Wentworth Higginson and Emily Dickinson. That's going to be presented by historians Richard Smith uh, and Catherine Maggie. Uh, and in the chat, if you scroll up fairly near the top of the chat, I placed the link uh, to the Eventbrite page for that event where you can read a full description and, and register for that if, if, if you, you like what you read. Um, so, uh, once again, thank you. This was, this was, uh, so beautiful and so thought provoking. And I, I love the, 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 uh, thoughtful questions that we got from, uh, participants. Yeah. And so we really love all the comments in chat and we can't respond to them all, but we really appreciate such interesting comments. It has been recorded. Uh, the, the chat, has, the chat is, is saved along with the recording. And what's, what I'm going to do over the next couple of days is that everyone who has registered for this presentation, I will send a link to the video. Um, so thank you all and have a, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Rich. Thank, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. OK, so we say goodbye. <laughs> hey, Shelley. Thank you so much, Rich. That was fun. Yeah, that was good. I